Good morning. We are in the 13th day of this war which was forced upon us, which we didn't want, which we have no choice but to win. Not because we seek revenge, but because we can't live like this. Last week I went to visit the people who were evacuated from Kfar Aza. At the entrance I met an elderly lady that I know, and she said to me, they killed my son, but at least I have cancer and I will die soon enough. I will not have to feel what I feel anymore. I met a 13-year-old girl who saw the murder of her best friend. I met a father whose wife and two children were abducted, sits alone in an empty apartment. I met people with hollow eyes who described to me what burned babies look like. The terrorists abducted a particularly large number of young women. We are trying not to think why, but we can't. I want to remind you, the horrors of October the 7th has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The terrorists are not part of the struggle for a Palestinian state. Hamas don't care about that. Just like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, they don't want any agreement with anyone. They want to kill Jews because they are Jews, and Christians because they are Christians, and moderate Muslims because they are moderate. They killed 260 young people who went to a music festival because Hamas don't like music, they only love death and bloodshed. It is interesting and shocking how quickly the world has moved on. Israel was giving barely a week of sympathy and global shock. And then the world went back to attacking us for defending ourselves. I've got one question to you all, and that question is really the reason we're here. Do you think an organization which has no problem butchering babies, butchering pregnant women, and butchering a 13-year-old autistic girl with an 80-year-old grandmother has any problem lying. Of all the distortions of the press coverage of the past days, the worst one is the balance. A large part of the media is offering its readers and viewers a balanced picture. They are presenting both sides equally. The story told by a democratic country that is trying to protect life and the story told by a murderous terror organization that hates life. Hamas lies as a policy. They murder our children and then they blame us. They murder their own children and then blames us. They use people as human shields, fire at them if they try to escape and cover for this with vast amount of fake news. There has never been a more cynical and horrific abuse of freedom of speech. My argument is that the media can't just claim to bring both sides of the story. If you do that, you are only bringing one, Hamas aside. That's cowardly and that's, it's lazy. It's an insult, insult to the victims, including the Palestinian victims. It's also an insult to the core idea of what journalism is. Believe me, I know I was a journalist for 31 years. I have no problem with criticism of Israel. But when you know that one side lies and one side makes every effort to verify the facts, the least we can expect is that you don't give a never-ending platform to the lies. Be suspicious. Be careful. Give us a fair chance and enough time to check the facts. I know you are all horrified by what happened. I know you've seen 
horrific sights. I know you've told the stories of the victims. I know that none of you want to support Hamas's evil, but that's the result. What's happening here in the past days is nothing less than terrible. Israel is trying to defend itself. We can't live like this. We can't ask our children to live like this. If the international media is objective, it serves Hamas. If it just shows both sides, it serves Hamas. If it creates symmetry between sufferings without first checking who caused it, it serves Hamas. I know you don't mean to, but that's the result, and it's time for it to change. I'm not telling you how to do your job, but it's got to change. We will be happy to work with you in any way you suggest to make sure the way this conflict is covered changes fundamentally. Thank you. We will now show you just a quick reminder of facts. Uh, this is what just happened to us. Um, and I want to talk about what happened in the, in the hospital. What happened in the hospital is that the lie was out there only for half an hour. But this half an hour is enough. This half an hour is the time in which people set their minds and their understanding of what has happened. So, you, go, go to the next slide. No, no, the one before. Even, Proof when the, of his even when, after this half an hour, they reversed the allegation that Israel has bombed the hospital, they went to some sort of a balanced version, which is also a lie. Hundreds fear dead in Gaza, hospital blast as Biden heads to Israel. Well, somebody blasted the hospital. And this is the Islamic Jihad. This was checked again and again. Go to the next slide. Show, I, 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 probably the majority of you saw it, but let's see this once Proof again. Proof of Israel's claims that it was actually missiles from the Gaza Strip shot uh, uh, into the direction of the El Ahali uh, Hospital in Gaza City and not from Israel. These are, this is uh, Channel 12's camera. It is a camera situated in the city of Netivot, and its view is of the Gaza Strip. You see the time uh, stamp on this. It's 6.59, and this is when it happens. We can pl press play on the tape, and you can see very clearly. Again, this is Channel 12's camera. Um, you can show that you can see the rockets. This is the uh, left red stamp fired over the hospital, which is the right, and you can see the blast. So that is proof of the fact that it came from the Gaza Strip, uh, a cam uh, our uh, cameras, Channel 12's cameras. Uh, the President of the United States has already said it appears it was done by the other team, meaning he uh, also realizes that it was shooting from inside Gaza over the hospital. The reason the President has said that is because this is what the Pentagon has told him. This modus operandi of Hamas, is not new. Uh, when I was Prime Minister, during Breaking Dawn, we have a smaller version of the same story when four children were killed by a missile off the Islamic Jihad, and it was the same story all over again because they said it, it's us, and then it was checked, and then people got the cameras and they got the feed and realized it was the Islamic Jihad missile who killed the four children. By the time the truth was out there, it was over and done with. The entire world was convinced that we killed four children that we did not kill. Go ahead. Again, this is what, that, that, just to remind you this really happened. This, I showed this to Christian Amanpour in CNN. It's a nine month old Kfir who was kidnapped with his brother Ariel, who's four years old, and their mother. Why do they need a nine-month-old kid? What kind of war is it that it is using nine-month-old babies? Go ahead. Uh, again, I'm telling you things you know about Hamas. And then, let, let me just remind you, this is not an only an Israeli problem. This is the problem of whoever fights terror. Go ahead. Now, I'm going to translate. This is what Hamas is doing. This is the headquarter of Hamas police. 
in the city of Gaza. This is civil housing, this is a school, this is a school. There are two ch children gardens here. This is how they place their facilities. Go ahead. Next one. Again, rocket launch site, rocket launch site, school. Again, civilian houses, civilian houses, civilian houses, civilian houses, civilian houses, rocket launch site. Again, rocket launch sites, school and a mosque. They, they don't even care about putting mosques next to it. So, no, just leave the top five points on the screen. And now we're willing to take questions. Yeah, yeah. Come up and ask for Hi, this is Jody Cohen from We On. I wanted to ask, this is a time of war, this is a time of emergency. We're seeing forces in the south of the country, in the north of the country, preparing to defend. Because it's a time of emergency, would you consider joining the emergency unity government as a message of unity to the people of Israel and also to Israel's enemies? Well, I was the first one to offer a unity government. Um, we were discussing how to make it as effective as possible. We couldn't get into an agreement, and I felt that this was wrong to keep on uh, negotiating in a time of war. So as you can see right now, I'm working, and I'm working with the government for the people of Israel. We have so many ways of doing so. The people of Israel are united. Whether or not it has a political translation doesn't, doesn't matter at all to nobody right now. Hi, thank you so much, opposition leader. Um, my name is Carrie Keller Lynn from Times of Israel. Um, I know that you just said that you're not interested now in joining the emergency government. Uh, could you comment on what the emergency government might be doing better, perhaps, to serve citizens of Israel? There's been a lot of criticism, of course, that the government hasn't gotten its act together to deal with civilian matters. Um, in addition, you keep um, you say in other interviews that you support this goal of eliminating Hamas. Do you have a suggestion for governance in the Gaza Strip after Hamas is limited should be achieved? Uh, I will start with this, this latter, not the former. Um, I think that when this ends, uh, the best solution is for the Palestinian Authority to go back to Gaza, as it did until 2005. Um, this, is, this is not ideal. It's, it's going to be long and problematic until we get there. But if you ask me what should be the exit strategy, the exit strategy shouldn't be Israel in any way ruling Gaza and the two million people who live there, but uh, uh, working with the international community, helping the Palestinian Authority back to Gaza. Uh, in terms of, I, I feel uncomfortable in the, for, about your second question. I feel a bit uncomfortable discussing with international media, civil problems we have with this government. So, but we are working with them in order to improve uh, the kind of services the Israeli public is getting in the time of war. I spent the entire day yesterday, for example, up north um, talking to uh, civil municipalities over there about what they need, and we are working with the government and will continue to do so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Stephanie Freed, <clears throat> China Global Television Network. Two questions, and going on what you were saying, which is now is not the time for criticism, you are the leader of the opposition, so what is your role? How do you perceive or view your role right now? Well, I said this is no time for criticism in international media. It's not that I'm not talking to them about the things that needs to be uh, uh, better. Uh, not only... Uh, the things that needs to be dealt better in, in terms of uh, uh, civil problem, but also in terms of uh, um, running this campaign. Uh, I have the ability to discuss this with the government, and I do so not, sometimes not even on daily basis, but on hourly basis. Um, and on top of this, what we do is we take initiatives to help the country in a, con in a time of need. For example, what we are doing right now, which is part of our effort to explain to the world what is really going on, unlike what Hamas is telling, um, I assume you understand that if I felt that uh, everybody is doing a great job in, in this, I wouldn't be bothering uh, initiating this. And then exp expanding on that, you talked about the North, and this is, there's a tremendous, if multiple fronts open up, 
And there's a tremendous campaign right now to evacuate civilians from the north, from the south, et cetera, et cetera. That demands funding, organization, all, all of the parameters that, uh, yeah. in terms of what you recommend or how it's being dealt with at the moment, there's a sense of, is that in place? Where are those, those elements? Where are they going to come from? No, there are, listen, there is a misconception now about Israel's strength. I understand where you're coming from. Last time I met you was in Sderot, opposite the ruins of the police station over there. So people are mistakenly thinking that Israel is at the peak of its weakness. No, we were at the peak of our weakness on October the 7th. We are not now. Israel is the strongest country in the Middle East and we, will find we have the abilities and the strength in order to fight more than one front. We don't want this. It's a bad idea. I think Hezbollah understands that we were caught by surprise a week and a half ago, 13 days ago. We are not surprised. Now we are angry. We are angry and powerful enough to run both arenas, but nobody thinks it's, in, it's a good idea. I think this is part of what the message of President Biden was yesterday, and this is part of our message is to the neighborhood. This is a bad time to mess with us. Uh, hello, I'm Graham Wood from The Atlantic Magazine in the United States. Um, in your previous answer about the future of Gaza after perhaps an invasion, uh, you mentioned that the Palestinian Authority might be an appropriate uh, government to rule there. That, with respect, that seems more like a hope than a plan, so I'd like to offer you a chance to elaborate on what your vision for Gaza might be, how it might be governed, what you think it could look like in, say, six months to a year. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's... I wouldn't summarize it or, or, or as or minimize it into a, just a hope uh, because uh, this is the way things were before. The Palestinian Authority still have about 20,000 people who are working for them inside Gaza and in the West Bank, and uh, a lot of the facilities there and, and um, civil organizations there are actually ran from afar by the Palestinian Authority. Again, this is not an easy task. But nothing is right now. Um, we are not going to rest until Hamas is gone from Gaza. And therefore, there will be a governmental vacuum there. And vacuums in nature and in human life tend to be filled. So we have to work with the international community to make sure the Palestinian Authority uh, goes in to help the people of Gaza. We have a fight with Hamas. We have no fight with the people of Gaza. Uh, Sharon Nitz, Italian Press, La Sette. Um, uh, what about the, in, the possibility of an explosion of the internal uh, uh, uprises in the, within the um, uh, Arab communities, like uh, what, what we saw in uh, Guardian of the Walls in 2000? It was interesting that we didn't see major demonstration in Lod, Ramle, or mixed cities two days ago, like we saw in um, the... Uh, our capitals, but what do, you, what do you think about, I mean, what is going on? Something, can you share a, bit, a little bit more about this because some uh, uh, lessons have been uh, learned from the past or maybe there is uh, the fear that when uh, the conflict is going to be broader, this, this um, crowd also will wake up? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wouldn't call them this crowd, these are Israeli uh, citizens, and uh, I don't think it's a good idea for us to be managed by fear. The Israeli police and also leaders of the Israeli Arab community are in a constant discussion in order to prevent this. They understand this as against everybody's interest. And also, because I was talking to some of the Arab leaders in Knesset, they are horrified by what happened in October the 7th. So we have to, of course, work together, all of us, against the radical elements within the Israeli Arab society to make sure this doesn't happen. There is a reason to be worried, but I don't want to be run by this, these worries. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, Davide Frattini, Corriere della Sera, international press, but I've been living here 20 years, so I'm sorry if I go back to a bit of internal politics. I would like to have a reaction if it's possible. I understand, of course, the idea of the unity of the country, but uh, some in the government, at least in the coalition,
they look more till now in a kind of a electoral campaign, the way they act and they talk, instead of a military campaign. So I would like to know if you are trying also, maybe behind doors, to stop this. They are still calling traitors people who were the first going down to fight, reacting against the families of the hostages, like uh, before uh, the 7th mm -hmm. of October, nothing changed. Well, the question comes to prove that you do live here for 20 years and understand how Israeli politics works. You're right. In many ways, we are working better with the government from the opposition than some of the elements of the coalition itself. And this is just another reason uh, why we can and should keep on working with them from where we are right now. I, I completely agree with you that uh, um, people who are dealing with their own politics in times like these um, doesn't deserve to be called patriots, let alone nationalists. So uh, I'm, I'm just agreeing with your criticism and we hope that people will come, go back to their senses and understand that they can act like this in a time of war. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everybody.